editor of the Econometrics Journal, Richard's in this place today, can't be here, very sad, can't be here, he's sad, I'm sad, it'd be nice to have him here. Um, this is the Econometrics Journal special session on model selection and inference. We have two speakers, very economically I think, they are both hands end, but they Bruce and Chris, and they're going to talk in reverse alphabetical order, so Chris Hansen is going to speak first. I'm going to just give a very tiny biography of both of them, and then they can have the rest of the session to themselves, I think is the way to go. So uh, Bruce Hansen is the Mary Claire Ashen Bremer Phipps Distinguished Chair of Economics. It's even longer than my title. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yeah, there's Trigami Holden, the Professor of Economics at Wisconsin University, who had a PhD in 1989 since I was last week. This place, BC, to Wisconsin, has worked on many, many papers on dynamic models, particularly structural change, structural breaks, and uh, today, though, he's talking about something uh, not quite the same about shrinkage estimation and vector order regressions. So program here uh, on the big data agenda, I guess. Thank you very much, Bruce, for talking with us. Uh, the first speaker today, though, is Chris, Christian Hansen. Chris is the Wallace W. Booth Professor of Econometrics and Statistics at the, I guess it must be the Wallace W. Booth. Different Booth. Different Booth. Different Booth. The Booth School. Uh, the business at the University of Chicago. This is an MIT PhD of 2000. And since then, has been at the Louvre of the Meteoric Rise. It's a full chair after just five years in 2001. Not chair sure after five years. Well, your feet are used to be typing. <laughs> 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 I guess that's the sort of measure and terror that we were discussing. Earlier <laughs> <laughs> on today, this works on a variety of topics in economic theory. I remember being absolutely inspired by one of his papers on uh, estimation of non separable uh, models with endogenous variables. Uh, he's worked in many other areas too, identification, estimation, calculating models, or estimation involving weak instruments. And today it's a paper, as we said, there's no easily pronounceable acronym here. It's yeah, so we got to an Albanian or a Christian name, we did it, but welcome Chris, thank you very much indeed for coming as well. Uh, the floor is yours, both of you, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, both of you, at least two related topics. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Andrew, for the lovely introduction, and thanks to all of you for sticking around to the very end of this conference. Um, I hope it's not too boring for the last session. So um, I'm going to be talking about that long title thing. It's a bit of a bait and a switch from the uh, title listed in the um, program. Uh, this is also a more preliminary work than I would usually present, but I got sick of presenting the other things. So um, we're going to present some work that uh, a bunch of us have been doing recently. So this is with Victor Chernyzhukov at MIT, um, Dennis Jeferikov at UCLA, Mert Demeyer, who is a student of Victor's at MIT, and uh, myself. Um, this is, like I said, this is pretty preliminary. We're still actually working on a bunch of stuff related to this paper. Um, but a preliminary version, I believe, is on archive now, so you can at least sort of see what's going on. All right. Um, so yeah, it's a long title, but basically you should think about this title as um, we want to use modern sort of machine learning methods um, because lots of people want to use them, and we jumped on that bandwagon. Um, but we also want to be able to do valid inference after using such methods for, we'll call them causal parameters, so things that uh, maybe economists would care about more than just a pure prediction exercise. All right, um, so there's a long title that basically says we're going to try to do inference after using machine learning methods. Okay, um, all right, so like I said, the main goal in this piece is to provide uh, estimators and inferential statements about a low dimensional parameter of interest, we'll call that parameter theta, um, in the presence of a high dimensional or non-parametric nuisance parameter, okay? So without the last clause in that first bullet point, this would be a traditional semi-parametric estimation problem, okay? So a 
and you're going to see it looks exactly like the traditional semi-parametric estimation problem. All right, we've got a low dimensional parameter we're trying to learn about. There is some high dimensional nuisance. And the departure we're going to make is we're going to try to estimate that high dimensional nuisance function using machine learning methods as opposed to more traditional non-parametric <coughs> methods that um, I assume all of you are very familiar with, like kernels or series, um, nearest neighbors, whatever. Okay, so we're gonna replace that step with a machine learning step. All right? Um, and you know that we really would like to be able to you know do this work to cover the sexy things people are doing in machine learning. So we'd like to be able to use random forests, or we'd like to be able to use boosting or some other things that maybe you know, maybe you don't, um, which have shown to be very effective in prediction in lots and lots of environments. They work with large data sets, they work with small data sets, they seem to be very effective. All right, um, and of course, the work we're gonna do, again, if you're familiar with the semi-parametric estimation literature, some of which is cited up there, is going to look really familiar because this is going to build very much on that fundamental semi-parametric estimation framework, all right? Um, now, why do we want to do this? Again, it's because these methods, certainly, you know, I work in a business school. My group at the business school is half statisticians, half econometricians, and I've seen machine learning methods now for a long time, and people keep telling me that they are incredibly effective at doing predictions. And they indeed seem to be quite effective at doing predictions, and there are a number of nice features about them. In particular, the really popular ones are roughly black box, which has some pros and some cons, but it's nice to be able to go out, push one button on your computer, and get a very flexible, very effective predictor. And that's something that, say, a random forest is going to deliver. All right, now, a problem with this is being, or maybe it's not a problem, but it is not obvious that providing a good predictor necessarily provides good answers for causal inference questions. It's not obvious that it necessarily provides valid inferential statements, okay? And so what we want to do is, show how we can use this modern machinery to answer the kinds of questions you would answer with a traditional semi-parametric model. Okay, um, and I don't need to belabor that. Okay, so in terms of the literature on inference using machine learning methods, there have been a bunch of papers that have focused on what I would call lasso type methods, particularly L1 penalized and estimation kinds of problems. And there's a bunch of citations up there. A number of them have my name on them, some don't. Okay, and there are a bunch of nice things about lasso type methods, which is why it was natural that we develop a bunch of theory for them. In particular, they're analytically tractable, they're computationally tractable, but it's the analytic tractability that was nice as a theorist. You could actually do a bunch of the algebra and show you get good properties with appropriate modifications of usual kinds of procedures. Okay, now, Again, as advertised on the first slide, I want to break away from lasso type methods in the talk today and consider more elaborate, more frontier kinds of machine learning methods that we <coughs> actually are using, okay? So um, I should also note that there are a couple of exceptions in the inference literature where the underlying machine learning technique being used is not lasso. Um, so there are the two papers by Susan Athey, one co-author the authored with Stefan Wager, the other with um, Guido Evans, both of which are looking at tree-based methods. And they also differ from what I'm going to do today in that the, at least the AP wager and the Inbuds and AC paper are much more non-parametric. They do not have a finite dimensional target parameter in mind. They're actually trying to model an entire res treatment response surface. Whereas we're focused on a low dimensional, maybe it's an average treatment effect, which is a summary of a treatment response surface, but we don't want the entire non-parametric object. All right. Um, and what we're going to be doing, and what I show you, is building off some results I have in a paper with Victor and Martin Spindler. Um, so we're going to take that framework and expand it beyond the lasso method. Okay. All right, so let me illustrate the basic ideas in a really simple context. Um, and this will be the context that I carry throughout the talk today. The paper covers a more general framework. Okay, so we've got a partially linear model. This is a semi-parametric model. We have a high dimensional nuisance function, what I call G0, which is then depending on a set of control variables Z. And we have the parameter of interest theta zero, which are the coefficients on the linear part in the partially linear model. So maybe D is a policy variable. We would like to understand what is the impact of D on Y, holding Z fixed. And we don't want to restrict the functional form for Z to be, say, linear. 
And Z itself may in fact be high dimensional. So Z might include a bunch of different predictor variables. All right, so that's the basic structural equation. We'll call it a structural equation. That's the model of interest. And then we added a second equation, and we'll make use of that. That second equation simply is an equation that captures confounding, okay? We don't think D was randomly assigned. We think D is correlated to Z somehow. And therefore, we have some non-parametric association between D and Z that we're going to worry about. Okay? So that's just a representation at this point, assuming you believe conditional expectations exist. All right. So there we go. There's the basic problem. We care only about the first equation, and we really care only about theta. All right. So again, if you are familiar with the classic semi-parametric literature, this is not going to look surprising at all. I've written down three moment equations that in principle you could use to identify theta. If you look at those three moment equations, you will see that they are all true. Okay, what does the first one say? It says if we could partial out the effect of z from the top equation, that's g zero, we could look at that residual. It's uncorrelated with d by the moment, condition, moment restriction written on the previous slide. Therefore, we could identify theta from that. Second equation looks like a propensity score adjustment. If I move this to a treatment effect setting, this would correspond to using a propensity score to control for the effect of control Z, okay? And we also know if we get rid of the confounding by partialing it out from D, we again have a valid moment restriction. The final equation is the one you all should immediately jump to, okay? That's the classic Robinson moment equation that's going to correspond to the semi-parametrically efficient score for learning the parameter theta zero, okay? That's going to be the one we use and I'll try to walk through why that is. Again, if you've seen some of you're familiar with this, this is not going to look surprising, okay? So, basic idea though, is rather than use a traditional non-parametric estimator to try to find those nuisance functions, be it G0, M0, or those conditional expectations, we're going to replace kernel or series with machine learning method, okay? So we're gonna to try to estimate the expectation of Y given Z, for example, using a random form. All right? And we would like to present results that are not specific to the machine learning method you choose. Okay, so there are results out there available for Lasso, but they are specific to using Lasso. There are results out there available for any of your favorite traditional non-parametric estimators. Okay, and we want to provide the extension that says you plug in your favorite machine learning method and it's still gonna work. All right, so we'll get to that in just a second. Now, why don't we use, say, the first equation, all right? This should hopefully be pretty familiar. Pretend somehow we had an estimator, a non-parametric estimator of G0, call that G hat, don't worry about where that came from, but we've got some way to non-parametrically estimate G hat. We plug that back, oops, that was not the right button. We plug that back into our first moment restriction we put in G hat and then we solve for the parameter D implied by that moment restriction. That's of course just the OLS estimator <coughs> given that the, that first line, it's really easy. And we can, re, we can decompose that estimator into two pieces. The first piece labeled A is obviously under any of your usual conditions going to be nice and well behaved. The second piece is the piece we're going to worry about. We're gonna call that piece B. What happens to piece B? All right, well, generically piece B is not going to converge, it's actually going to diverge, okay? And the basic idea heuristically is quite simple, okay, so we'll not worry about the details. If you care about details, go look at the other literature or look at this paper, okay? But what's the basic idea? We've got that estimation error showing up inside a root n normalized sum, okay? Estimation error, at best, it's going to look like one over root n. So if we had a nice parametric, everything well-behaved model, that's going to look like one over root n. As soon as you try to estimate that non-parametrically, it's going to look worse than one over root n. Okay? And so, heuristically, what we're going to end up with is an object that looks like root n times something, which is vanishing, but it's vanishing at a slow rate. And therefore, that term, in principle, diverges. Okay? In other words, if we normalize by root n, we don't get a consistent asymptotically normal estimator, we get something that diverges, we have a slower rate of convergence, and we don't like that, okay? So, we could do the same exact argument with equate moment equation two, so it doesn't matter propensity score or regression adjustment, 
they're gonna have the same thing going on. What does equation three do? Well, equation three does both. Okay, so you're going to use, again, going back to the treatment effects sort of language, you're gonna use the parentheses score, and you are also going to use regression adjustment. All right, and what's the value added to doing that? Well, again, we look at equation three, we solve it for the parameter of interest, We've plugged in non-parametric estimates of the nuisance functions. Those non-parametric estimates were estimated by machine learning methods. Okay, and what we have, V hat, is just the residual from partially now controls from the endogenous variable, or sorry, the variable of interest. W hat is the residual from partially controls out from the left-hand side variable. We solve this equation. We can again decompose our estimator into two pieces. Okay, there's actually a third piece up there, but it's small, so we're not gonna worry about it. Okay, what are those two pieces? Again, we've got term A star. Under any of your usual sorts of assumptions, A star is gonna be well behaved. Now, what does B star look like? I'm sure it's on the next slide, so I'll flip there. No, <coughs> not on the next slide, so we'll sit here. Okay, what does B star look like? All right, B star is now a root end normalized object, just like it was before but it's the product of two estimation errors, okay? That product is important, why? Well, each of the estimation errors itself is vanishing. If you multiply two vanishing things together, what happens, it vanishes more quickly, all right? So heuristically, by regression adjusting and propensity score balancing, we're eliminating to an additional order the influence of the non parametric <coughs> estimation. All right, and so we can then show that, oops, wrong direction, sorry. We can then show that that term B star is again going to look like a root n times now a product of estimation errors. And as long as that product of estimation errors is fast enough, particularly the usual semi parametric condition is you need to estimate nuisance functions at a rate faster than n to the minus one fourth. Take n to the minus one fourth plus n to the minus one, or times n to the minus one fourth to get n to the minus one half, and hit that by root n, we're good. All right, so that's all that's going on. And this shouldn't, again, this should not be surprising. This is just basic semi parametrics in a nutshell. So, first thing we need, which is no different than in any other semi parametric estimation context, is we need to use orthogonalized estimating equations. That's jargon I've seen before, I actually read that in Bruce's, I think it's in some book you wrote, okay? Anyway, we've got um, orth these orthogonal estimating <coughs> equations, all right? And what do we mean by orthogonal? Oh, it's not on the next slide, so we'll, I'll tell you what we mean by orthogonal in a second. All right, what is this slide showing? This is showing if we take that exercise, and instead of using a traditional non parametric estimator, we use a random forest, all right? And we're also going to do one other thing which is not clear from this slide. We're going to use sample splitting. And sample splitting is going to be important for our theoretical results and I'll try to explain why that is. All right, what are the two histograms up there? So there's a blue one and a red one. The red histogram is the resulting estimate of a treatment effect. After using random forest to learn the nuisance functions and using the orthogonal estimate equation, in other words, the efficient score. Okay, and theta zero is the true parameter value. What you can see, there's actually a little bias that we'll talk about later, okay? But you can see you've got something that looks at least kind of Gaussian, and it's kind of close to being centered over the value that you would like to be centered over. What's the blue thing? The blue thing is same procedure, but you use moment equation number two, which was the propensity score adjustment moment equation. Okay, and really all I want you to see is you're shifted out more, okay? Why? Well, because you don't get this product of estimation errors, the non parametric estimation bias in estimating the nuisance function by a random forest is not averaging out quickly enough. And we're left over with something where if you took, say, size of 5% level tests, the size using that blue curve is going to be very close to one, okay? It's actually about 90%. The size based on the red curve is around 10%. Not great, and we'll come back and talk about that. I would much rather have 5% for a 5% level test Okay, but we're getting in the ballpark. So that's the first ingredient though, orthogonal estimating equations, that keeps bias manageable is the intuition for that. All right, now, okay, this is what I just said. 
Okay, so the key difference between those two curves and the moment equations one and two and moment equation three is the moment equation three corresponds to a moment condition that has an orthogonality property. Okay, in particular, what you have is if you look at that moment condition as a function of the nuisance parameters, and you look at the derivative of the moment condition with respect to those nuisance parameters, and then evaluate the derivative at the truth, you get back zero. Okay, what does that say in words? That says a local perturbation in the nuisance function does not invalidate the moment condition. Okay, that's really nice because what's going to happen when you use any kind of non parish estimator, machine learning or otherwise, in an exercise like this, you're not going to be plugging in the true value. You're plugging in an estimator of it. That's a local perturbation of the truth. Your moment condition had better still be true when you perturb that function. Okay, so that's the orthogonality condition we need. There's a you know, reasonably formal statement there in the partially linear model. There's a very formal statement in the paper, but the basic idea is simple. Moment condition needs to be valid when you perturb the moment function a little bit by plugging in not quite the right value of the nuisance function. Okay? So, We'll now move off the partially linear model to the more general model. Sorry, Andrew, I'm not keeping track of time. What? Oh, you're doing good. I mean, you've got 20 minutes. 20 minutes, yes. All right, we're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's look at a more general model really quickly. Okay, so what we have here, we have just a general semi parametric estimation problem. Psi is a moment function. Theta zero is the parameter of interest. A to zero is your high dimensional nuisance function. All right, we believe you know, the economic theory whatever we're looking at tells us that this moment function is true. All right, and then we of course have data which I've denoted W. All right, we believe the nuisance functions belong to some convex set and that we can put a norm over that convex set. All right, and for some reason we called that norm the E norm, which don't ask me why we called it the E norm, but that's the E norm, okay. Um, anyway, there's some norm that will show up that's not the two norm or the one norm or anything else. That's the natural norm for this space. All right. Now, next thing we're going to do, and this is an artifact, I think, of wanting to provide very generic results for machine learning methods, is we're going to split the sample. Okay. And we're going to allow you to split the sample not evenly, although it's hard for me to imagine why you wouldn't want a 50-50 split, but if you want a 90-10 split, go ahead. Or a 10-90 split or a 5-95, I don't care. Okay, so we were going to split the sample into two components. Okay, and when you see the lowercase n, lowercase n is the number of observations that you're actually going to use after splitting the sample. Capital N is the total number of observations you had available, but you just threw a bunch of them away. Okay, so we have lowercase n observations left over. We're going to live in an IID or an independent framework anyway, so we're going to split the sample at random. Okay, we've got a random partition then that just breaks our sample into its two bits. And any asymptotic results we present are going to be taking lowercase n to infinity. Okay, so we're going to assume that after splitting, you still have a reasonably big sample. All right, now why are we doing sample splitting? I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of sample splitting, but why are we doing it? We're doing it because, unfortunately, the sorts of refined results you need to do to verify good properties of the second step inference after doing a machine learning method are just not available. So when we did the lasso results, we didn't have to sample split. Why? Because lasso has a simple enough analytic structure. We could actually work through everything without sample splitting and show that things worked out well. Okay. Once you go to a random forest, we don't have simple enough analytic structure. And so we're going to cheat and split the sample. And that's going to make a bunch of the conditions we need much more simple to look at and to verify. Um, so I hope I'm not being too honest, but you know, that's why it's a theoretical device. <coughs> I am not sure whether it's necessary. What I am sure is given the proof concepts that we are currently using, it is not clear how you would prove validity of the inference after using these machine learning methods without sample splitting. Um, so that's the cost of what we're doing. If you look at the AP wager and the AP inbound stuff, you'll notice they're also sample splitting. 
family. So that seems to be at least, again, given the proof methods we have now, that's a way that allows us to relax some entropy bounds and some other things by keeping the problem nice and tractable. All right. So that's all in the background now. The fact that we split the sample already happened. Okay, and I don't know if I explicitly mentioned that for quite a while, but remember, it is actually important to the theoretical results we're presenting. The sample has already been split. And if you look through the proofs, you'll see that we make heavy use of the sample split. Okay, so now, next key condition is the orthogonality condition. So I already talked about that, I'm not going to belabor it. You just need your moment functions to be locally robust to small perturbations of the nuisance functions. Okay, um, we'll talk a little more about that in a second. All right, now we're going to give you the conditions. All right, um, J0 is just the usual Hessian kind of matrix that's going around in estimation. Okay, um, so that's the derivative of the moment condition, evaluate the truth. Fine with that. We've got a bunch of numbers that we're not going to worry about. I'll probably just focus on the words in blue. Okay, so what conditions do we need? None of these should be terribly surprising again to anyone who's looked at semi parametric So first of all, we can't have the parameter show up on the boundary. Fine, we all know that's somewhere in any asymptotic normality result. If we didn't want asymptotic normality, we wanted to do something more elaborate, <coughs> we could deal with that, but let's not worry about it. So the parameter is safely moved away from the boundary of the parameter space. Okay, second, we have to have a notion of differentiability. Okay. You'll notice the differentiability here is of the population moment condition. It's not of the psi function itself. So this covers a variety of non-smooth objective functions. So quantile regression is fine, things like that. All right, next, I've talked about this a number of times. We need the orthogonality condition. That's really the most important in terms of this stuff that's going on here. One thing I will note at this point, the orthogonality condition is of course a local condition. And that means it doesn't have to hold over the whole parameter space T, so capital T without the script, is the parameter space for the nuisance function. Script T is going to be a much smaller parameter space where we're going to know the truth is going to lie with high probability because we're going to be using consistent estimators at the end of the day. Okay, so we need the orthogonality to hold, again, only in a small region <coughs> around the true value. All right. Third condition just says the model's identified. That's hard to get away from. Um, Andrew tries. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're just gonna assume point identification. That's what that assumption is doing. All right, and then we've got a bunch of equicontinuity style conditions that if you care about, you can look at and say there's a bunch of equicontinuity style conditions, okay? In terms of those conditions, the seemingly fundamental one is again the orthogonality condition. All right. Third thing we need, so we have three key ingredients in the status variables. One, sample splitting. Two, orthogonality. Three, you can't use bad estimators of the nuisance function. Okay, that shouldn't be surprising either, but that's what our next set of conditions are gonna say. Okay, so all of these conditions are regarding your ability to estimate those non-parametric or high-dimensional objects that are showing up in the problem. Okay, so, these two conditions together basically are telling you a rate of convergence for your non-parametric estimator. All right, remember script T is a subset of the space in which the high dimensional object lives. All right, and if you take these two conditions, what does it say? It says the truth is in that neighborhood. It says the estimator will be in that neighborhood with high probability. All right. And then it says for any element of that neighborhood, the distance between that element and the truth is small. Okay, that tau pi n is then going to be literally the rate of convergence of your non parametric estimator. Okay, so you take these two things together, we've just told you your non parametric estimator is converging at rate tau pi n. Okay, now we have an entropy condition. This is important, and again, this is somewhere where the sample splitting helps. The entropy condition says the function you're trying to learn and your approximation to the function you're trying to learn are not too complex. Okay, it's again a fairly standard condition, but we're gonna have to live with that. 
Okay, we've got a moment condition, which is not that big a deal. We've got some rate conditions, which are more refined than really and probably necessary. But if you look at these, a sufficient condition for these rate conditions is n to the minus one fourth convergence of the non parentage estimator. Okay, so again, you know, I think maybe some other co-authors would sell this more than I am, but I want to just sell this as this is semi parametrics. If you ignore the sample splitting step, these are exactly the results you would use to establish good properties of any semi-parametric estimator. Okay? We're adding the sample splitting because that's going to help us relax a bunch of other things and maybe we'll see that. Okay, maybe it's not clear. And the reason maybe it's not clear is because you're used to seeing results like this from semi-parametrics. All right, what's underlying those results from usual traditional semi-parametrics is the fact that kernels and series are well-behaved. We can do the kind of analysis that says, you know what, these are all the conditions we need. If you look at our results on Lasso, which are not presented here because this is not that paper, you will see that the results we have for Lasso, which do not rely on sample splitting, are stronger, or sorry, the conditions are stronger than the conditions we've written down here. Why? Because Lasso is a less well-behaved estimator than a kernel or a series. Of course, it handles a different set, different scenario. Okay, to get yourself to handle that scenario, you have to make some trade-offs, all right? These conditions are weaker than the conditions we've written down for good properties after using lasso estimation, but they come with the thing I hid, but have tried to make very clear what we're doing. That's because we're sample splitting, okay? If we weren't sample splitting, then we could not use this weak standard set of conditions to establish good properties of the resulting estimator. Okay, so it really is those three things. If you want to use machine learning methods to do non-parametric or high-dimensional estimation, at least given the proof concepts we have now, you either use lasso and the full sample, or you use something more elaborate, but you split the sample. All right? And hopefully, I really hope somebody smarter comes along and shows that you don't have to split the sample. Um, but at this point, that's what we've got. Okay, if you take all of those results together, what does that give you? It gives you our main result, which is in the middle of this slide, which says the semi-parametric estimator of the parameter you care about has a very nice asymptotic representation. We get root n asymptotic normality. We get sensible inference, exactly the way you would think based on semi-parametric estimation. Those inferential statements are valid uniformly over a fairly large class of models. Okay, that class of models is of course expanding as the sample size increases. All right, and this is a set of, I will argue, nice properties to have. Okay, again, if you didn't want the uniform validity, which maybe we don't, I think we do, you could get validity without sample splitting. Okay, but that would be point-wise, and we could then cook up very sensible scenarios where your inference is gonna look really poor. Okay, to get the uniform validity, we're also making use of that sample splitting. All right, now, I don't have that long to <coughs> talk, so um, a couple more comments. In terms of the uh, orthogonality condition, every model you write down does not satisfy that condition, unfortunately. Okay, however, you can often create a situation where that condition is satisfied by following very classic stuff from the semi-parametric estimation literature. So I'll quickly illustrate that in the likelihood of context and maybe I'll finish. Okay, so this goes back to Neyman 79, actually it goes back to Neyman 59, but you know, at least there, maybe longer. All right, so the basic idea, we've written down a likelihood model. Again, we could do this more generally, but let's live with a likelihood model. Okay, we've got parameter we care about alpha, we've got nuisance parameter beta. Beta is high dimensional, but you know, it doesn't matter really. Okay, <clears throat> we know that under regularity, we have score equations satisfied, okay? And what you should look at is if you look at those score equations and look at the type of orthogonality, which is you differentiate those score equations with respect to the nuisance parameter, you do not have those score equations are locally robust to perturbations in the nuisance parameter, okay? So what do you do? You define new score equations, okay, um, through a simple partially now idea, all right? So, We've defined a new moment condition on this slide called psi. What's psi? Again, the parameter of interest is alpha, which I've redefined <coughs> theta, sorry. <laughs> There's now a theta on this slide. Okay, the parameter of interest is theta, which I redefined from alpha on the previous slide. 
All right? Um, we've got the original score equation for theta, and then we've subtracted a piece off. What is that piece? That piece is mu times the score for the nuisance parameter. Mu has a particular definition, which I'm not going to go through because I don't have time, but there it is. Mu solves this system of equations. Okay? And it's very easy to see if you look at the score equation at the top of this slide that the desired orthogonality property is true. Okay? You can do this sort of transformation quite generally. The important thing to notice, which I think is really interesting, is in order to guarantee the orthogonality property, we had to expand the dimension of the nuisance parameter. Okay, so the original nuisance parameter was dimension p, which is the dimension of beta. The new nuisance parameter is the dimension of mu plus the dimension of p, or sorry, of beta. <coughs> mu is a matrix, which is d rows, d is the number of parameters you care about, times dimension of beta columns. So to ensure orthogonality, you've had to greatly magnify the dimension of the nuisance space. And again, full honesty, which I suppose is not a good idea. We haven't really dealt with that. Okay? At this point, we just said, well, there's another nuisance parameter, mu. We just throw that in with beta. We redefine the nuisance space as mu beta, and we move on. But that new nuisance parameter could be very, very high dimensional. Okay? In a lot of cases, it turns out to be very manageable. So in the partially linear model, super easy. We take your original moment function and we add one new nuisance function, the conditional expectation of y given z. That's fine. The original nuisance function was the conditional expectation of d given z. We add one more, not a big deal. In a context like this, we've added a bunch of nuisance functions. All right? Um, OK. So I'm going to end on time. So we'll skip that. Partially linear model we've already talked about. Um, I just want to note. If you go back and look at what look maybe like complex conditions, in the partially linear model, they boil down to very, very simple conditions. So you just need boundedness of moments, boundedness of the parameter vector, and n to the one-fourth convergence of the non parameter estimators. If you take these three conditions and compare them to the conditions in our restud paper on the partially linear model with Lasso, these are substantially easier. Okay? And the reason, again, is for sample splits. We're cheating a little bit. All right? Um, all right, so I think I'm out of time. Well, Here's don't have any questions. Well, we don't we don't need questions at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> these guys want to ask. All right, so I think what I'll do is just end on a very preliminary, not very interesting empirical example. But you know, as a theorist, we don't have to do interesting empirical examples. Um, so we're going to look at. Well, the, uh, this 401 casing I've looked at a bunch of times, and I'm not going to go through it too much. We want to understand financial assets of individuals. We want to understand how that's affected by whether they are involved, in this case, working at a firm that offers a 401k, which is just a government subsidized retirement account. Okay? And the story that was told in this series of papers by Paterba, Venti, and Wise, which we're building on, said this is fine as an identification argument as long as you control for the other characteristics of the job that people might have been considering when they were deciding to take the job or not. Okay? And their argument, in a really brief nutshell, boils down to we're only looking at data from right after 401ks were introduced. This argument would definitely not hold water now. Right around when 401ks were introduced, probably a lot of people were not terribly cognizant of it. They were looking at features of the job when they were trying to decide what job to take, like their income and other amenities. But this new program that was out there probably didn't enter their mind. That's the argument, you can buy it or not. But the key feature of that argument is you have to control for the other features of the job. Okay? And even in their data set, this seems perhaps to a lot of you like the low dimensional context, but it's not. So we have 9,000 observations, 10,000 observations, and we have a set of like nine variables. I should remember, but we'll say nine. A set of nine variables. Okay? And you then should ask, what does it mean to control for nine variables? And the answer, maybe, is, well, you just put nine variables into your linear model and you run the regression of y on 401k and those nine variables, in which case this is low dimensional. Or maybe you actually have to estimate a nine dimensional nuisance function, where that nuisance function is the non-parametric object that captures all of the ways these things could affect your savings or your eligibility. 
Okay? And again, we can argue about whether nine is big or small, but I will argue nine dimensional non parametric estimation with 10,000 observations puts you, in fact, in the high dimensional model setting. We all know the results that say if you want to do really well using a kernel estimator with nine or 10 variables, you need millions of observations. Okay, so we want to use a modern machine learning sort of result. We hope it does a better job. There are at least claims that they predict better. So we're going to use a modern non parametric estimator based on a bunch of different things. We're actually going to use a ton of different estimators. Okay, so, you know, the top equation is just if you look at y on z directly, which we know suffers from this clear um, endogeneity bias, you get an estimate of $20,000. Okay, so it being eligible for a 401k increases savings by $20,000, but we know that that's you know, all sorts of confounding going on there. If you look at a linear regression, just using the raw variables, you get an effect of $6,000 with a reasonably big standard error. Um, you may or may not find this interesting. I find it interesting, a bunch of the other stuff. Okay, so baseline number three is what shows up in the Turby Benthi Wise papers. So we just took the specification they ran with in all their papers. Um, I will argue that's a pretty sensible non parametric estimator. If you actually look back, they didn't run the linear regression of Y on stuff. They carefully dummied things out. They thought a bunch about where do we think really these differences are at. And I will call this heuristic, intuitive, but pretty sensible non parametrics. Okay? They get an answer of about $8,700. Now, we tried a bunch of different machine learning methods. So, Tree, maybe you can ask about these if you care. I'll just say the name. So, Tree is a machine learning method. Our point estimate is really similar to the Turby Benthi Wide estimate. Random forests are probably the most popular machine learning method out there. And see, it's not quite the same as the Peturbo Venti Wise estimate, but it's within spinning distance. Okay? Boosted trees are perhaps my current favorite machine learning method. And we see that they're pretty darn close again. All right? And then we try a bunch of other stuff. So all of these, I should point out, if you're not aware of this stuff, the reason people like trees, forests, and say boosted trees <coughs> is they are pretty researcher independent. You push a button, you get an answer out. Okay? These other methods, ridge, lasso, etc., require a bit more input from the researcher in that you have to specify the set of basis functions you're going to be considering. So I take this nine variables, and from these nine variables, I construct 299 variables that I think hopefully capture whatever nonlinear and interaction structure is out there. Okay, we estimate those, and I'm just going to quickly say they're all within spitting distance of each other. They're all pretty close. Um, Bruce might be interested in this. We've talked about this before. The things in red are the ones that beat on the out of sample validation exercise, which is something we can do because we did split the sample. And maybe that's a benefit of being able to split the sample. So we can look at the out of sample validation exercise. I find it interesting that Ridge pre is preferred. Um, and then finally, if you take the combination where you choose the RMSE minimizer at each step, you end up with an estimate, which is, again, because they're all pretty close to each other, pretty close. Okay? So, Turbo Venti and Wise are probably happy. We get answers that are pretty close to their answers. Okay? The theory suggests this should be the case. The theory says you sample split, you use your favorite non parametric estimator, you should get within the ballpark of the right answer. Okay, and we sort of see that here. And so I went through those. Let me just say, so things that I would like to, you know, like, so this is preliminary, we're still working on a bunch of stuff. Um, sample splitting, something I don't like, it adds randomness. Obviously, you split the sample once, but you could have split it tons and tons of other ways. How to think about that randomness, characterize it, and maybe even exploit it to improve inferential properties is something we're working on. All right. Um, the other thing I don't like about sample splitting is small sample biases, unfortunately, get exacerbated when you split your sample. And all the estimators we're talking about suffer from big, small sample biases. Okay, I think that's a really big deal. Um, you would often solve that by undersmoothing. It's less obvious how you would undersmooth in this context. Okay? And then the final thing we're interested in is if we are going to go to the effort of sample splitting, in principle, we could use that as a validation device and as a method to build a better ensemble. <coughs> So you think about model averaging, you think about a bunch of other things based on those validation exercises you could run. So we'll end. I think I'm more or less on time. Hope anything That's right. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, so 
Yeah, so you, you mentioned that the simple splitting is key in handling the entropy bounds. Yes. Is there a, perhaps there isn't, is there a, 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 a clean, intuitive way of explaining how? So, because I mean, essentially you, yeah, yeah, you wanted the simple splitting to do with the complexity of. Yeah, yeah. think uh, about, um, <coughs> it helps. So, think about this, this following scenario. Pretend you're actually doing model selection, which is what I said I was going to talk about. Okay. Um, and what you do when you do model selection is, of course, you go out and you try a bunch of different models. You choose the very best one based on the data set you've looked at. And what does that do in terms of you know, theory? That bumps up the entropy. So you're saying, I'm going to fit the most complex thing I can fit within this class. Okay. By sample splitting, what do you do? You do the same thing using half the data. So you're going to overfit by accident within that half of the data. But that entropy introduced by overfitting does not carry over to the other part, because that's random relative to the rest. So you've added some noise, but you haven't added complexity. And that, that's sort of the key insight here. Anything, any other questions? Let's ask some questions at the end, if you still want to get through that. Sounds Thank good. Thank you very much. Routinely, routinely, routinely for uh, multi step forecasting, impulse response analysis, variance decompositions, and compare properties of structural models versus um, these kind of reduced form specifications. Now, you have a bunch of choices when you uh, pick a, a bar. So, this session is supposed to be about model selection. Or, um, uh, or, so, so, this is the kind of the model specification issue in a bar. Well, which variables? Uh, how many variables? Uh, so how big should n be? Should it be two? Well, maybe it could be one. You have a simple auto regression. Maybe it's 20. Maybe it's seven. How, which variables? Um, how many legs? One leg, 10 legs, five legs. Um, we also have the question of, of an addition about what sample period should we use? How big should the sample size um, be? Now, these things are all involve a huge amount of trade-offs in practice. Now, 
from a kind of a complexity point of view, what we should want to use is the most recent sample period so that we eliminate structural change, but use every single variable imaginable in the universe and use a bazillion legs. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's cost to doing that, so we can't. So the way I'm talking about it here is it's be tempting to take a big data approach of having lots of variables and use many legs to account for the dynamics. Um, but when you do that, you see that each equation is going to have approximately m times p coefficients, and that's going to be very, very large uh, in practice. And in most applications, people are worried about using small samples because of potential structural change. So to, to get around uh, this problem, you need to do some sort of regularization. I think we all know what uh, regularization means. It's controlling the dimensionality. Now, Sims recognized this when he proposed the VAR structure, and he said, the solution is to keep M small, two or three, okay? Um, but of course, that's not uh, the only approach to regularization. So I list a few methods here we're gonna go on. Um, so you can set M and P to small. Now, like I said, Sim suggests that it's really working. Fundamentally, that, that's arbitrary. That doesn't sound um, satisfactory. Another thing which a lot of people used in the early days and continues to be done is to do classic model selection namely to use the AIC criteria, the BIC criteria, or we're in the UK, so people do testing. Um, but <laughs> these, um, we call them in statistics, hard threshold rules. And we know, going back to judge and other things from a long time ago, that hard threshold rules lead to estimators of poor risk, uh, high risk, meaning high uh, mean square forecast error, for example, in, in forecasting. So smooth uh, methods tend to work better than hard methods. Um, another kind of regularization would be penalization. Um, we heard just a lot of Chris talking about things like lasso and its family um, and uh, things coming up. I um, am not an expert in, in the lasso, so I'm going to stay away from that, let other people work on that. Um, it's certainly very fashionable and very useful for handling large number of variables, um, but ha has also deficiencies about whether or not it's tight sparsity and stuff. The things I'm going to be talking about are closer to the ancient literature introduced by Stein about shrinkage methods and similar also to ideas of model combination. Now in addition, a huge area that's specifically uh, popular for the application of vector auto regressions is, is Bayesian methods, or BVARs. Now part of the reason I believe it got really popular in the VAR literature is because of Chris Sims. He, he felt he pushed this as a particularly uh, constructive way of dealing with uh, high dimensional uh, vector auto regressions. So um, it's, it's widely used in the in practical uh, macro work. And what, what, what do the BVARs methods effectively do? It shrinks a large model down to a tight model. And, and Sims has emphasized the importance of very tight models. The tight models are the priors that where you're centering on. And the two most common things that Sim has uh, pushed was the so-called Minnesota prior, uh, which is a random walk, and some coefficients prior, which is an integrated order one system without co-integration. Okay, there's a rich applied literature, but um, there's almost zero frequentness or sampling theory um, about this. And I just mentioned there's like, I think the state of the art of the uh, BVAR literature is this recent paper, Review Economics and Statistics, which showed using an out of sample um, comparison that BVARs are really kicked um, by defeating their competitors and leaving them in the dust. <laughs> so he actually was very aggressively uh, uh, pointing out how, how well they, they work compared to other methods. Now, just to mention, um, I'd like to try to do something different than BVAR. Um, one deficiency of the BVAR me method, I believe, is that it produces identical shrinkage of the estimates regardless of the forecast horizon. That is, if you want to forecast at horizon equal 1 or horizon equal 12, it's exactly the same parameter estimate. <coughs> But there's no reason from a theoretical point of view that you'd want to use the same estimator for different forecast horizons. You simply have a different objective function. So probably the optimal model or the optimal degree of shrinkage depends on the variable you're looking at will depend on the forecast horizon. Another thing about the VVAR models or any kind of Bayesian method is it's not designed to produce a model with good risk. It's designed to produce a method with high posterior odds. Um, that is different. I am focused on thinking if you can articulate clearly your loss function and your risk function, then we can design methods that would do well for those things. I'm going to care about forecast. I'm going to be focusing on forecasting. I care about mean square forecast here. 
Um, another thing, which is my, my own personal pet peeve about the forecasting literature, everyone does out of sample forecast comparisons. Very, very, very popular. Um, people often call it a gold standard. Um, I don't think, however, that uh, out of sample comparisons really tell us about sampling properties of estimators. They simply tell you how estimators work in particular samples. Um, and one of the problems is that we have small samples out of sample tend to um, exasperate small sample problems. If you have the estimates are random, the initial sample sizes are very, very small, and that biases resorts towards extreme versions of shrinkage. Take, for example, this recent uh, state-of-the-art paper. They work with a model which has seven variables, five lags. So that means that each equation has 36 parameters to estimate. And they do recursive estimations um, on the sample size 200, but they start with a sample size 59. So they're doing least squares estimation with 59 observations with 36 coefficients. I think we all know that that least squares estimate doesn't work very well. And it, it, in particular, the least squares estimate for forecasting um, is not going to give you a very good indication of what's going to happen with a full sample of 200 observations is used. It, in that context, the, the, the methods are going to tell you shrink, you know, aggressively because uh, 36 is just far too many coefficients. I mean, you never would actually estimate 36 coefficients by least squares with only 59 observations. <laughs> now, what's the goal that I'm going to try to do here? Um, I want to develop a frequentist estimator based on shrinkage, trying to focus on a user-specified uh, measure of loss, mean square forecast error, and, uh, and it turns out that it's closely related to the mean square error of, of impulse responses. It's going to come up with a, what I call a spine type estimator and a frequentist um, moving average. My estimators are going to be specific for the forecast horizon. So I'm going to say you have a seven variable system, but um, let's focus on forecasting GDP out of that seven variable system at forecast horizon seven. And then the methods are going to vary by forecast horizon and my variable. Um, so you're going to have a family of estimates. Um, you could unify them, but I, my presumption is that you'll do better if you try to dis do the estimates uh, from horizon by horizon. Um, the methods effectively take the unconstrained least squares estimates and shrink them towards constrained estimates. Now, what the downside of this, um, the way I've phrased it so far, is that um, you need to have one overarching big model. So the one bigger overarching big model can't be too big because it has to be estimated pretty decently. It'd be nice to generalize this to where you have kind of the more big data setting. You have 200 observations, but you have 400 variables. I think I could probably handle that doing some sort of cross-validation method, but um, not right now. So this is not really high dimensional, more moderate dimensional. Um, the basic theory that comes out is to recognize that these multi-step forecasts are nonlinear functions of our parameters. And then you, by the delta method, we can do asymptotic normality. Once you have normality, you can do sign. Um, so let's go back to the model. You have a dynamic equation. Y is a linear function of legs. Um, and then it'll be convenient to write that as Y is equal to BX. What is X? X is leg wise. But just to write it that was regression. Now there's two ways of thinking about the parameter. It's B is a matrix or you can take theta as a vector. Theta as a vector is useful when talking about asymptotic normality, but B is useful when thinking about the dynamics. It's also useful to think about the Markov representation, namely I have X is the list of all the Y's, and so I can write it as a vector <coughs> of the word one, X is P times X leg plus an error, where P is a function of um, the parameters, it's just the, the parameters put out in that matrix there. Uh, from a standard um, kind of textbook format formula. That's useful because um, to think about forecasting, it's very convenient to iterate the VAR1 equation um, rather than the VAR P equation. So what's my goal? I want to forecast one variable at the system. So I have Y as a vector, take the jth element, and I'm going to fix the horizon H. So this is, I'm going to forecast seven periods ahead the first variable. So if you iterate the Markov representation, you find that x in eight periods ahead is a linear <coughs> function of x uh, of the current value of x in, in the past. Um, that then tells you that the optimal point forecast is the jth element of the vector p raised to the power h times x. 
So you take this Markov representation matrix, you multiply it by itself h times, and then you multiply that by the current uh, the current list of the last values in the sample. Um, we also can, can do the forecast by iterating the uh, bar equation typically, but this is really convenient for the theory. That tells you that the optimal point forecast can be viewed as beta prime x, where beta is this um, p raised to the power h matrix, then you select off um, a, 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 a column of it. So this is simply saying that the optimal forecast is, is a linear function of the, regre of the regressors. The forecast coefficient beta, I'm just gonna call it beta, but it's a function of theta. It's also specific to the variable j that you try to forecast and the forecast horizon h. Um, but it's a nonlinear function, but it's a known nonlinear function um, of these things. So the optimal point forecast, once again, is beta prime x. Now suppose you have an estimate beta hat, then a feasible point forecast is beta hat prime x, so the forecast error is the difference between y and beta prime x, or y minus beta hat prime x for the actual. So that tells you that the mean square forecast error is approximately the expected square of the error plus the expected square of the estimation part, and the expected square of the estimation part is the mean square error of beta hat. So the mean square forecast error is affected by estimation almost 100% through the mean square error of beta hat. Beta hat is this nonlinear function of the original parameter estimates theta hat, but it tells you what you care about. If I care about forecasting, I care about that object. This is weighted um, mean square error. So if I want to come up with an efficient forecast in the sense of small mean square forecast error, I want to have low mean square error of beta hat. So let's think about an another problem, uh, impulse response. It turns out it's the same deal. So what you do is you take the model, you eliminate the intercept, and then you, look, and, and then you do the same analysis. Namely, I'll call it Z, the list of all the Y legs. Then I have this mark re representation for Z in terms of coefficients. So it's kind of like the model for the original data, but there's no intercept in it. And then you iterate it a bunch of times, so you realize that the impulse response of the jth variable with respect to the shock vector is the jth row of this P matrix raised to the power H. So once again, the impulse response is an element of the P matrix raised to the power H, and so it's identical to the forecast coefficient, just with a uh, intercept inter uh, eliminated. This, this is not new, this is all known stuff, but um, it, it's just convenient to realize that for out of sample forecasting and impulse response analysis, you're doing an estimated, almost essentially the same nonlinear transformation of the variables, uh, of the coefficients. So efficient, um, for efficient impulse response estimation, I'd like to have low mean square error of the uh, impulse response estimate, which is it's really just the means, you use mean square error as an estimate uh, way of measuring its risk. That would depend in principle on a weight matrix, but unlike the forecasting case where the, the weight matrix is the design of the X's, there's no optimal or natural weight matrix. Here you think probably the identity, which would be the one that we would think of. But I'm gonna use Q just so I, I'm gonna use the design matrix, um, the X prime X matrix, just so that way, um, uh, I can have a unified treatment for impulse responses and forecasting for now. So once again, what's the general setting? I have a parameter vector. I have this nonlinear transformation of it called beta. I want to then uh, think about the mean square error of this estimate. So um, L is the expectation of, of an estimator in a quadratic form. I multiply it by sample size so that way um, we can do asymptotics. And so L is the risk of the estimator, say beta tilde. So I now want to calculate the risk of a bunch of estimators and pick the estimator with the smallest risk. Um, now suppose that you have an estimator beta tilde that's asymptotically normal, but let's suppose it has an asymptotic bias because we're not using the full sample, not the full, the biggest model, I use some sort of um, small model in some way. Then beta tilde could be asymptotically normal with some delta bias some delta in the um, asymptotic uh, mean. And if you want to think about it formally, you'd get that by thinking of that your big model is local to, the, to a small model in kind of the standard uh, framework. But it doesn't really matter what it is um, for our purposes now. Um, but it's, the delta is the bias. And then I just 
the asymptotic variance is some asymptotic variance matrix, okay? So if the mean square error is this quadratic expectation of beta tilde, then the risk L, and beta tilde has this asymptotic distribution, then the risk is approximately delta prime um, W delta, or delta W is Q, but delta prime Q delta plus the, um, the variance part, which is the trace of the weight matrix times the variance beta hat. So we know the form of the mean square error. It's a quadratic in the bias plus the variance. Well, uh, mean square error is bias plus variance. Okay, we knew that, but I'm just writing that out here. I want to find an estimator with small values of the risk. Okay. How are we going to do that? We have to estimate it. So L is bias squared plus variance. Um, I need, the variance is the easy part. We have formulas for the variance, typically. Um, what about the bias? Well, this is where I'm going to punt, in a sense, that um, Let's assume we have an uh, approximately unbiased estimator. That's the big, so I have a supermodel um, that's approximately unbiased. Then an estimate of the bias is the difference between the full model estimate and the small model estimate. That's delta hat multiplied by root n for <coughs> the scaling. That suggests that you estimate the risk by delta hat prime, the squared bias by delta hat in the quadratic form. Well, there's a problem with that, um, and that is biased. That is, because of the scaling, um, delta hat is, is kind of random, and so the expected value of delta hat prime delta hat is the true bias squared plus the variance of delta hat. Okay, so an unbiased estimator of the risk is the squared bias estimate minus um, the, the variance part that you don't really want there plus the variance of the original estimator. So there's these three components. and But this is all now quite feasible. I, you have um, just your estimator, an estimator, an estimator of the variance, and an estimator of the variance. Once you have this formula, then you're going to pick the estimator with the one with the smallest estimated risk. This is sound complicated? Well, this is really Akaiki, and he just was doing it in the context of cold blood fiber uh, risk, but it, it really goes back to him. An idea closest related to this specific context is the focused information criterion of Short and Claskins, where they're uh, saying, hey, if you have a parameter of interest, you can write down uh, the loss function. Just in, when they do in their work, they're thinking of the beta as being a scalar. My beta is a vector. <coughs> so let's now think about um, estimators. Well, the, the simplest estimator is the big estimator. It's least squares on, on, on everything. So beta hat um, is least squares estimator. Theta is the vector of that. It's asymptotically normal. Um, so then you form. Um, the beta hat is this nonlinear function, which is you form this matrix and then iterate it h times, and then you do the for, um, point forecast based on beta hat. And now the delta method tells you that beta hat is approximately a linear function of the delta hat, sorry, linear function of the theta hat, and so therefore it's asymptotically normal with the standard delta hat covariance matrix. Okay. Now why is that important? Because I'm going to estimate that variance to calculate the risk. Um, now, to shrink, we need to have smaller models. Now, this is where Sims comes to play. Sims said, hey, the small model should be the random block. That when, el when all else, you don't know what to do, use a random block, because data is approximately a random block, right? So, but in general, we could use a whole bunch of different restriction mo uh, smaller models. You started out with a var of order p. Obviously, a var of order r, or any r less than p, is a good idea. Um, so. And that's the most natural restriction is lag restrictions. Um, another natural restriction would be some sort of exclusion restriction. Um, I, haven't, I've thought, I haven't quite thought about exactly how to make this happen yet, but I think it makes sense that if you have like 10 variables, you might, might want to think about using a bar of order, which is one variable, and two variables, and three variables. Maybe you have a hierarchy of what variables are most important and not. Um, and so I would like to, I haven't, in, done this numerically, but I like to implement the idea of using smaller models as well as big models as something we could combine over. Um, Sim's idea, of course, is random walk with drift as a natural restriction model. Another one that he has pushed is the I1 model with a coefficient matrices sum of identity. Um, when you have restrictions, you can write them as B is the coefficient matrix, B times a restriction matrix, R is equal to another matrix. A, 
Um, little r is going to index the restriction. Let's suppose we have m different restrictions, m different models. So this is again like a uh, random walk model, uh, sub coefficients model, var1, var2, var3, etc. To, to do a constrained least squares is really easy. Of course, you can just do least squares on your, on your model, or you can just um, do a linear transformation of the big model. That's convenient because then the parameters of, of interest are just going to be linear transformations of, of the big model that is useful for the asymptotic theory, namely that the theta hat estimated on a restriction model is approximately a linear function of the theta hat on the big model, and therefore it's a linear rotation of the same normal random vector. But each of the restricted models is going to have some sort of bias delta, which um, so you have a smaller variance, but some sort of big bias. The coefficient of interest beta hat is um, constructed from uh, these restricted models, and then you get your point forecast for each model. And that is, this is algebra is just telling you, it's by the delta method, it's approximately <coughs> a linear function of the big model estimate, and therefore it's asymptotically normal with a variance covariance matrix I can compute. So that's all that's really saying. And that for the um, estimate of risk, it turns out that there's two variance covariance matrices you need. You need the um, variance covariance matrix, the difference between your estimator and the true beta. That's the third bullet point. And then the last bullet point is the difference between the least squares estimator and the restricted estimator, and it has the variance written there. So you need, what's important here is that you just need to have these two covariance matrices. Um, in order to, to do the risk calculation. So now let's think about what I would call Stein shrinkage, going back to the uh, work, classic work by Stein. So you really have two estimators. One is the full estimator, the kitchen sink, and the other is some sort of restriction model. That would be like um, the random walk. The Stein estimator is a linear combination of those two estimators, so I'll call it P hat star with a weight w, weight times beta hat plus one minus w times uh, the restriction beta one. To calculate the optimal weight, you need to calculate the variance of the estimator and the variance of the difference of the estimator with the least squares estimator. So you just plug it in and play around with, it, with the formulas and you can get out the exact formula of those two things. Where you see the variance of beta hat star has a component that doesn't depend on the weight and a component that um, is multiplied by the square of the weight. And the asymptotic variance of the difference of the least squares estimator and the Stein estimator is quadratic in one minus the weight. So you just work out that algebra, you can find those expressions. And then you plug those into the Stein estimate of risk. Namely, the risk is the quadratic and the difference between the Stein estimator in the least squares, that's your estimate of bias, minus the variance of that component, plus the variance of the estimator. So if you work out these formulas, which were quadratic, and you work them out, um, you find that the Stein estimate of risk is a quadratic in the weight, plus a linear term times a penalty tau, um, where the Quantity tau depends upon the variance, the variance estimators. This, so what we have, we have the the, um, the risk of a Stein estimator, which is a linear. So you take a linear combination of the least squares estimator and a restricted estimator as a function of the weight. You work out what the risk is of that estimator viewed as a function of the weight, and then you minimize that across all weights. This is conceptually the same idea as picking the model with the smallest AIC, but instead of just picking across models, I'm picking across this continuum of weights. And the minimizer is this formula, one minus tau divided by this quadratic in the um, coefficient estimates. So what is that denominator? It says that if the, if the restricted estimator beta one hat is close to the unrestricted estimator beta hat, that denominator will be small. If that's too true, then tau divided by that will be big, and this weight will be zero. And all the weight will be put on the restricted model. On the other hand, if the difference between these two estimates is big, 
when the ratio of tau to that quadratic form is small, and the weight's gonna be close to one, you put all the weight on the unrestricted estimator. So the sine estimator is a linear combination of, of um, the two estimators where the weights are picked and dodged based on the data, depending on the information in the data. And as Stein originally showed, this does better than um, the original estimator, as long as the dimension exceeds three, or something, depending on common, the actual coefficient tau you use. And so you end up with this kind of estimator. Beta has stars, this linear combination with this particular weight function, and you shrink towards something like random block. And the tau is this particular functional form. <coughs> now that's, so that's a, a conceptually simple idea, but in practice, probably you don't want to really just shrink towards a random block because that's a little bit too narrow. So instead, I might think that I've estimated a bunch of different models. I've estimated a bar one, a bar two, bar three, uh, all the way up to the big model. I estimate a random block, I estimated an I1 model, I estimate models possibly with a different number of variables in them. I have just a bunch of models, a whole bunch of them. But they're all special cases of the, of the big bar. Each special case estimator corresponds to a particular restriction matrix, a particular least squares estimator, a particular forecast coefficient, and a particular point forecast. Okay? I want to combine all of them. So I define a weight vector which is of the same dimension as the number of um, models. I'm going to constrain my weights to be positive and sum to one. That is an important regularization that could be relaxed, um, but you have to have some sort of regularization on the weights. The common, that says commendation, but it's uh, commendation. That's a nice phrase, commendation. The combination estimator is um, the linear combination of these individual estimators, and you can view it as a linear functional in the weight vector. And our combination forecast is, is this course of the same weights. You just take your point estimates, you aggregate them uh, using this combination weights. The asymptotic distribution of the estimator with fixed weights is a normal random variable with a bias and a variance. And the variance you can estimate. The, the asymptotic distribution of the difference between the least squares estimator and this combination estimator is also asymptotically normal with a bias and a variance, and you can estimate the variance. There's a formula. You then plug those into the estimate of risk. So the estimate of the risk, again, is a quadratic in the difference between the combination estimator and the least squared <coughs> estimator minus an estimate of, of the variance plus an estimate of the, of the other variance. And then you do some algebra and you find that it is precisely a quadratic expression in the weights where the, um, quadratic, the quadratic part has to do with uh, the coefficient estimates of the different models and the linear part has to do with penalty terms. So the estimate of the risk is a quadratic in the measures of the deviations of the estimates from the big estimator, subject to a penalty, which are kind of like the number of parameters being estimated. So what do we find again? The estimate of the risk of a combination estimator is a quadratic in the weight vector. It's the estimate of the risk. The estimated rate vector should be the choice, or could be the choice, I'm gonna advocate that it is the choice, which minimizes our estimate of the risk, that's our estimated best combination. Conceptually, it's similar to the old idea of Akaiki, which says, pick the model with the smallest estimated click, or final pre prediction error, select the model with the smallest estimated mean square forecast error cross-validation, which is selecting the model as far as expected squared error or the focus information criterion. The difference is that we're picking, instead of a model, we're selecting a weight vector. So I want to minimize a quadratic. That would be really trivial, except that um, the weights should lie in the unit simplex. Turns out it's still some trivial, it's just quadratic programming. And it gives you a weight beta hat you can use that for forecast combination, or you can, it also equals the impulse response at a specific horizon. The combination forecast is just the average of these guys. Um, it has some similarities to some other work that I've 
done. <laughs> when m equals two, this is identical to the what I call the asymptotic Stein estimator of a paper just came out in the Journal of Econometrics. Um, when forecast horizon is one, this is identical to what I call the Mallow's model averaging estimator. But when um, h is bigger than one, the S, this, we have this nonlinear transformation, so it's different. Um, and also, it's identical to the forecast model averaging estimator um, that I, in a journal of econometrics paper. But I, the generalization occurs when the number of models exceeds two and um, the horizon exceeds one. And it's, this hasn't been presented before, but kind of a nonlinear multi model generalization of these techniques. Computation is very simple. Let's do a simulation experiment. Um, this is all very preliminary. I, um, my research assistant emailed me the results on Saturday night. Um, I was back before I was going to get on the plane on Sunday. So it's um, so this is going through a lot of iterations, of course. So um, for simplicity, I, I, I at this point have done a bar with two legs um, with five variables. So each equation has like eleven of possible coefficients in it, not that much, but I have a small sample, 50, um, so that, that we still have finite sample effects. Now, um, how do I parameterize this? I want to try to have a model which has a lot of persistence, kind of close to a random walk, but also not for dynamics. So um, I have a parameter C, which when it's zero, everything's going to be I1. And so B1, the, the, the leading coefficient it is close to an identity matrix. And B2, and then B1 plus D, B2 had this extra deviation, which is just all, all the variables affect everything symmetrically with, a co with another coefficient, little b. Um, and that's just done because I, I want to have everything affecting everything else. So when the parameter C is zero, the variables are I1. So I want to think of C being positive but small. When B is equal to zero, the process is a vector of auto regression of order one. So I want to think about moving B from zero to a positive number to see the effect of correlation. Um, and it's symmetric in all the variables, so I don't, when I look at the mu score forecast area, I can just look at any of the variables, so just look at the first one. I sent to the simulation, I generated data of length, sample size 50 plus 32, I throw away the first 20, and then use um, 20, 50 for estimation, and then the remaining 12 uh, for forecasting, so I generate out of sample forecasts for horizons 1 through 12, um, based on the sample size 50, and then uh, compare the, real, the forecast with the realizations and calculate mean square forecast error using uh, 10,000 simulations. Um, and then to normalize, I take, I'm going to um, take the mean square error of, of the different methods and compare it with least square. So least square is the benchmark. So if, if the numbers are less than one, it's doing better than least square. And if it's bigger than one, then not. Um, what are the methods I compare? I do. Um, Least squares on the on, on the full model, the vector of uh, regression <coughs> two. I also estimate a bar one. I estimate a random walk. Uh, with, that is, with random walk, you just estimate the intercept um, after differencing. Uh, then I do the Stein shrinkage of combining uh, those models. So the Stein shrinkage estimator is just m equals three, three models here. And then also I um, compare with the Bayesian bar method. I just I take this um, recent paper. Review in economics and statistics. I think it's kind of touted as being the state of the art of the DVAR literature, and um, I just use their default, the default method. They've kind of they have the, the MATLAB code on the web, so it's easy to use. Um, one computational note is that method takes like 30 times, I don't know, much more computational because it's estimated by MCMC. So it's um, computationally, my method is trivial. Their method is, well, you know, you don't wait that long. <laughs> um, so what is this table? This is a case for b equals zero, meaning that the truth is just the bar one. And I'm going to vary um, the parameter c from 0.1 to 0.3. This is degree of persistence. So when c is equal to zero, you have random walk. And as it gets positive, it gets more stationary. And that this is the relative mean square forecast error of the method relative to these squares. So numbers less than one mean the methods do better than least squares. So if you look at AC for the one of um, one step ahead forecast, the B of our model does the best. It has um, a relative mean square forecast error about 75% to 82% of that of least squares. 
and the method I'm proposing does slightly worse. So I'm un unhappy about that. Um, I maybe have to shrink in some other extra fund dimensions. But, but what I think was, what is intriguing, though, is this is what I expected, is that when you look at the long horizons, the ranking flips. So like, if you look at the 12 step ahead horizon um, um, for like C equals um, 0.2 or 0.3, the uh, BVAR method is doing worse than least squares. Um, and then, but the, B, the Stein method is doing better than these squares, although um, not necessarily much better. Now you say, why would the BFR method do worse? And it's simply because it's not targeted for that problem. It's designed to produce a model with, with high posterior odds. It's not designed to produce a method with, with low mean square forecaster. So there's no reason to expect it to do well. Um, and it, and it, um, it is, that's what, what happens. Well, the Stein method is designed, so remember the, the the forecast coefficients are different across forecast horizons. Effectively, what's happening is at the long horizons, you're doing more shrinkage because at long horizons, um, the least squared estimates are, are, are noisy. And so you uh, want to take that into account. That's B equals zero. Here's um, B equals 0 0.5, 0 0.05. And the results are essentially the same. Not, not a huge difference in, in the, the estimates. I increase this to 0 0.1, and, or the, this is the largest I go because at 0.2, the model um, has a, uh, uh, leaves a stationary region. Um, and so once again, the, what you're finding is that for one step ahead forecast, the BVAR method has, has very good prop, uh, risk, but for higher um, uh, forecast horizons, you can do better by the shrinkage method in general. Um, uh, but this is all still very preliminary, and this is, of course, uh, constrained to this particular um, simulation experiment. So to conclude, shrinkage is a type of regularization. It can improve precision. Um, there's, of course, other kinds of shrinkage that we could use. I think that the Stein shrinkage are, uh, is particularly well suited when we have a clearly articulated risk function that happens to be quadratic. And when you have a risk function that's not quadratic, we don't really know how to estimate the risk that easily. Um, so that's partly why the quadratic is pretty cool. Um, the simulations also tell us a little a caveat, which is that along horizons age, it's really difficult to improve on these squares. <laughs> that's kind of sad. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, you know, and so, by the way, you know, for, what's important? Like, when people are doing like monthly bars for forecasting, nobody cares about one step. One step ahead forecast. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, just to be blunt here, we're doing monthly forecasts. You're interested in any year ahead, two years ahead. You're in a long term forecast because that's what matters. Most of often, you know, one step ahead, it's just the current value. It, it is, is pretty kind of low. So you are, but the policymakers, what they want is things that are a year or two years from now at a minimum. Uh, so when I say that the long horizons, um, you know, we have these ranking differences, it's that's because that's what's important. That, that, I mean, I think it's, it's probably, I know, like if you're a short-term fre frequency trader, maybe you care about short horizons. But, um, but from like the macro forecasting point of view, I think the long horizons are, are more relevant uh, for decision making. So that's it. Thanks very much. Questions, comments, remarks, Tarek? Uh, I wonder if the, uh, is there any B bar or maybe some modern average or you know, some empirical based procedure which can exactly replicate your shrinkage? And, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, the, the, so the traditional, so I, I don't, I really don't know, but the, in, in the case of, of two models, the Stein estimator has a representation in terms of a, a Bayes estimator with kind of a funny prior. Funny prior, right? that's a technical term. Um, but, you, <laughs> <laughs> but you go look like in, in the book and in, 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 in Negative Casala and, and stuff where that, that there is a prior that will produce a Stein estimator. But it's not a very natural. But what happens there is that it's, it's kind of it's kind of quasi-based. But in the multiple case, we don't know. I don't know. But one would guess so. <laughs>